And so now with that, we'll move on here to our third hymn, uh, the, the hymn uh, for this the Sunday, November 22nd. And that will be hymn 532, The Head That Once Was Crowned With Thorns. And so let's go ahead and we'll start off here by listening to the tune for hymn 532, The Head That Once Was Crowned With Thorns. All right, and there's the tune for hymn 532, The Head That Once Was Crowned With Thorns. And so, uh, again, let's start off here with that gospel reading for this Sunday, and we'll keep it in Matthew 25 here, as we have for the last two weeks. And this will be Matthew 25, in particular, verses 31 to 46. This is uh, comes right at the end of what's known as the eschatological discourse, Jesus speaking about the end times, right? What's going to happen? And it's a very famous passage. It's the passage of the sheep and the goats, where the Lord says he'll, on that day he'll separate us all, uh, sheep on his right, goats on his left, and he will say to the sheep, right, enter into eternal life. And he'll say to the goats on his left, depart from me, go into that outer darkness. And so there we see again uh, that, that idea of believers and unbelievers, that there's, there's two ways to go. Uh, it's either eternal life through faith in Christ or it's eternal condemnation because we've run away from Christ, because we've not trusted in his word. And so we'll see this uh, come up here as, as this is our, our, the last Sunday of the church year. And that idea of the return of Christ, of our resurrection, of, of judgment, all these things are present in the readings and also here in this hymn. And so with that, let's go ahead and dive right on in here to stanza one of hymn 532. The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. A royal diadem adorns the mighty victor's brow. And we'll stop it there. And so here, I think a beautiful way to start the hymn, right? The head that once was crowned with thorns. Instantly, that takes our minds right to the cross where our Lord uh, has those thorns on his head. He's nailed to the cross and he dies for us, right? And so it says, you know, as the hymn starts, it's bringing all that up by mentioning just those crown of thorns, right? And so the head that once was crowned with thorns, well now, that's not the case. Instead, his head is crowned with glory, right? Royal diadems adore the mighty victor's brow. And I think that word victor is very important here. Uh, that uh, now, as he has this glory and this honor and the, and the royal diadems, why does he have it? Because he is the victor. He has defeated sin and death on our behalf. This is his glory, right? God's glory, Christ's glory, is that he has defeated the devil for us. He's defeated our sin for us. He has won for us the forgiveness of all our sins. And so the hymn starts us off there and, and sets us on that solid footing of remembering uh, that Christ's glory comes through his cross, through his death, and through his resurrection. And so with that, uh, with that foundation in place, let's move in here to stanza two. The highest place that heaven affords is his, is his by right, the King of kings and Lord of lords in heaven's eternal light. And we'll stop it right there. So again, we're, we're praising the Lord here as we begin this hymn. The highest place that heaven affords is his, is Christ's, is Christ's by right. And I think this is an important point here. Uh, it is Christ's by right to be seated at the right hand of the Father. Not only because he is God, right, true God of true God, but also because he alone uh, has lived uh, as a man, right, God and man in the person of Jesus Christ and lived a perfect life, fulfilled the law, suffered and died, uh, and rose again, right? He was justified. He was, he was declared righteous and holy through all of this, because he truly is. And so by right, right, by his merits, he deserves that place of honor and glory. And as the hymn says with those familiar titles, he is then the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the eternal light and life uh, for all of us. And so uh, we kind of start off there again with that idea, coming from his cross and resurrection, 
that Christ truly has all glory and all power by right, by the, the fact that he is perfect and holy in every way. And so with this, I will keep moving then into stanza three. The joy of all who dwell above, the joy of all below, to whom he manifests his love and grants his name to know. There stands a three. I think this is a big point too here. We get that word joy coming up again. That not only is Christ the joy of all who dwell above, right? The angels and the archangels and, and all the saints who have gone before us. But he is also the joy for all of us, right? As the hymn says, the joy of all uh, to whom he, he manifests his love and causes his name to be known. That he is our joy. It's not the things of this world that bring us joy. It is Christ who brings us joy. It is Christ who through the forgiveness of sins, through that righteousness that he gives us, brings us that everlasting joy. A joy that the world cannot touch, cannot take away from us, no matter how bad things may be here and now. That the Lord, through his forgiveness, brings us that joy. And how does he do that? Well, as the hymn says it right there, by manifesting his love to us. And what is his love? Well, that he would suffer and die uh, for us on the cross to forgive us all of our sins. And then uh, he grants his name to be known. He doesn't just do this and then say, okay, everything's good. No, instead he lets us know who he is, right? Who our Lord is. We don't have to search for it. We don't have to figure it out. He tells us who he is and he creates that faith in us so that his love, his forgiveness, his joy may always be with us because we always bear his name, right? And so some beautiful words here on joy. And I think something that, that really is good to remember, uh, especially uh, during these difficult days, that, that it is Christ who is our joy and our crown. And so now uh, with that, we'll move on here to stanza four. To them, the cross with all its shame, with all its grace is given. Their name, an everlasting name, their joy, the joy of heaven. And there's the end of stanza four. And I think here stanza four is now where we make that shift, right? We've talked about Christ, who he is, uh, how by his right he, he earns all of this, he has all of this. Well, now stanza four says to us, right? To those who bear the name of Christ, to those, uh, to us who, who have received his love. Well, to us, his cross is given, right? And it makes this great point. The cross is given with all of its shame, right? It is shameful that our God had to die on the, that cross for us. And yet it is given to us not with that shame, but with that grace, right? With all of its shame, but with all of its grace. Because truly that is where the grace of God is shown. That our sin would not uh, be given to, or, or the punishment for our sin would not be given to us but would instead be placed upon Christ. That is truly the grace of God. And in the cross, that grace is given to us. By his death, that grace is now ours, that we should not have to suffer the punishment for our sin because our Lord has taken that for us. And so as the, the stanza ends, right, their name, right, our name, Christians, all of us, and the bride of Christ will be an everlasting name. It will not fade away. It will be written in that book of life forever and it will be known and it will keep going for all eternity. And our joy will be not the joy of this earth, but the joy of heaven, the joy that has no ending, the joy that goes on and on because sin is defeated. And I think this is such a marvelous way to, to put it here, to kind of picture salvation. And we have an everlasting name and we have a joy that is not uh, of this world, but a joy that is of the Lord himself. And so with this, we move in uh, then to stanza five. They suffer with their Lord below. They reign with him above. Their prophet and their joy to know the mystery of his love. And there's the end of stanza five. And so here it kind of sums up the Christian life so well. We suffer with the Lord here below. That yes, here on this world, in this sinful and broken world, we suffer but we don't suffer alone because our Lord suffers as well. He suffered uh, in his earthly life, 
and your scripture will say it this way in, in many different ways, right? But it will talk about how Christ became like us in every way, even taking our sufferings upon himself. And so we see that in his life. He suffers in many ways. He, he suffers the temptations of the devil. He suffers pain and death on the cross. He, he suffers uh, his his disciples leaving him, even uh, his God forsaking him, right? And so when we suffer, we know that we have a God who knows what it is to suffer, uh, who can be there with us in our suffering because he himself has suffered too. And so as the hymn puts it that way, right? We suffer with our Lord, but we also reign with him. We reign with him above that as we suffer here, as he did, now as he reigns, well, we reign as well. We are victorious over sin and death, not because of us, but because of him, because of what he has done for us on the cross. And so as this stands and then ends, uh, our profit and our joy, right? Our gain and our joy is to know the mystery of his love. It's not to, to gain up things on this earth. Instead, what is our greatest gain? Uh, the, the apostle Paul says this so well, right? Uh, that Christ is our greatest gain. Christ is our greatest profit, our greatest uh, treasure. And truly, he is our greatest joy as well. To know the love that is Jesus Christ. That he would come, he would suffer, and he would die for us so that we may live. That is our greatest possession, our greatest treasure, our greatest joy. And so now the hymn will kind of wrap this all up. That, that joy and that gain, that treasure that we have in Christ here with stanza six. The cross he bore is life and health, though shame and death to him, his people's hope, his people's wealth, their everlasting theme. And there's the end of the hymn. And so as it says here again, we go back to the cross just as we started with the cross. The cross for Christ uh, that he bore, right? The cross that Christ bore is life and health. Like his death, his, his death on the cross is our very life here and unto eternity. It's also our health, giving health to our bodies and our souls. Yes, right here and now, but most especially in the resurrection of the dead, where we will receive those glorified bodies that will never again get sick, will never again break down and decay. And so truly, all of this is ours because of the cross, because he bore that for our life and our health. And even though uh, this is life and health to us, as the hymn says, to him it was shame and death. And here we see kind of that great exchange. That why is this shame and death to him? Well, because he was taking our shame and our death. And why is the cross life and health to us? Because through that exchange, he is now giving us life and health. And so as the hymn then ties it up, he is our hope. He is our wealth. He is our everlasting theme, that he is the one who for all eternity will be the one that we will praise and acknowledge uh, and the one who we will trust in and be with for all eternity. And so the hymn there ends uh, with that really great reminder that it is Christ in all things, no matter what we go through, it is Christ that we look to, that he is the one who is our prophet, is our gain, is our wealth, is our treasure is our joy and is, in fact, our very life. Life, And so I think this hymn here, uh, hymn 532, does such a great job of, of really beginning us with the cross, ending with the cross, and showing us all along the way how Christ's death and resurrection truly is everything to us. Everything here and now and everything unto eternity. And so there uh, is hymn 532, the head that once was crowned with thorns. <laughs>